Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. We finally reached our very last video on the blood vessel topic, video Q, where we're going to take a closer look at perfusion in specific organs of the body. Let's take a look at some of these organs, tissue perfusion, the skeletal muscles, the brain, the skin, the heart, and the lungs, especially because we're going to see that autoregulation occurs in the opposite direction than what we've just studied in the previous slide, and you will see why that is. It will make complete sense. Here, then, we see a nice chart that compares perfusion in the different organs of the body or regions of the body uh, by comparing what perfusion is like at rest. So this first column shows us the amount of blood flow per minute in the different uh, organs at rest. Well, here we see what the blood flow or perfusion will be at uh, maximal exercise. Clearly, when we start using our skeletal muscles, uh, we expect to see a severe increase in perfusion. Notice that we have almost a tenfold increase. For the heart as well, we expect that the heart is going to need much more blood because it has to pump much harder to get the blood around to keep those skeletal muscles going. Interesting feature here to notice is that the brain, no matter what, is going to try to maintain a very constant level of perfusion. Take note, take note what the brain does. No matter how hard we exercise, we're going to try to maintain a very constant perfusion level. Our skin is also going to jump from about 500 to 1900 milliliters per minute and that of course has a lot to do with having to cool off thermal regulation. Now while we're exercising maximally or while we're perhaps fighting for our lives or fleeing away from a very dangerous situation that is not the time for us to either make urine with the help of the kidneys or start digesting our foods. And consequently, we see that in the kidneys and in the digestive structures in particular, we see a drop of blood flow. There's no reason for the blood to go to those particular areas in very high volume levels. After all, we need these structures to that is your skeletal muscles and your heart and also your integument um, to receive most of that blood. So let's take a quick look at perfusion of the heart. Remember that the coronary circulation takes care of the heart tissue, the cardiac tissue itself. And your left and your right coronary arteries, don't forget, they arise from the aorta and consequently they depend on the pressure in the aorta. Now what's interesting about the heart is that while it goes through systole, so while we're going to ventricular systole, those coronary vessels are going to be compressed. Consequently, we don't have a very good blood supply to the heart. As a matter of fact, we see that the blood flow pretty much stops momentarily. But within our heart muscle, we have myoglobin, kind of similar to hemoglobin, that can bind uh, enough amounts of oxygen to hold over those cardiac, cardiac tissue cells. And then during ventricular diastole, we're starting to see that blood starts to flow again through the coronary circulation and oxygen and nutrients can reach the cardiac fibers. Now, what exactly is the mechanism, the autoregulatory mechanism, that uh, takes care of tissue perfusion in the heart primarily? And well, the answer to that is myogenic. So the capillaries of the heart that feed the heart are dependent primarily on myogenic mechanisms to um, perfuse the heart. As a matter of fact, our heart cells are very demanding, and they require almost two-thirds of the oxygen that is carried to them in the blood, while the other tissues only get about a quarter of the oxygen carried in the blood. 
And interestingly enough, because of the myogenic mechanism, we see that the blood flow remains relatively constant in the coronary circulation, um, despite the fact that the coronary vessels are experiencing those uh, major systolic and diastolic events in the heart. Now, when we do go through strenuous exercise, we're going to see that the heart is going to depend on metabolic controls as well, because the vessels are starting to accumulate pretty significant amounts of carbon dioxide. And of course, that carbon dioxide needs to be removed so that oxygen can take it, its place. And for that, we are going to see that the metabolic mechanisms are going to play a role. Notice that blood flow in the heart can increase three to four times in, in an attempt to get enough oxygen to the heart during uh, strenuous exercise. The brain, as we already pointed out, will pretty much do anything and everything to maintain a very constant tissue perfusion. Primarily because our nerve cells, our neurons, really cannot tolerate what is called ischemia. Ischemia means low blood flow, low blood flow. Our neurons are, again, very metabolically active. They require a lot of uh, ATP, go through lots of aerobic respiration, so they need to have a good blood supply. And the brain depends on both mechanisms, both autoregulatory short-term mechanisms, meaning they tissue perfusion is adjusted based on pH and carbon dioxide levels. We'll really focus on this um, in the respiratory system, but also myogenic controls play an important role. Let's say that our blood pressure starts to drop systemically, so let's say our MAP starts to drop. Um, what we'll see is that the vessels in the brain are going to go through vasodilation in an attempt to maintain proper tissue perfusion. And the opposite is the case uh, when systemic blood pressure starts to rise. Blood flow in skeletal muscles at rest is primarily controlled by myogenic mechanisms, but also by the extrinsic neural mechanisms that um, include the sympathetic fibers that innervate the blood vessels. Now, when we begin to exercise, we see that there's a bit of a, a, a tendency to have the metabolic control mechanisms take over. We're starting to lose a lot of oxygen to the very actively to the very active skeletal muscles carbon dioxide is starting to build up metabolic wastes are starting to build up and consequently instead of the sympathetic nervous system um, regulating blood flow and skeletal muscle we see that the metabolic mechan auto regulatory mechanism really is going to play an important role what happens as a result of the increased blood flow in skeletal muscles due to exercise is sometimes referred to as active or exercise hyperemia. Hyperemia meaning more blood. Now, in other parts of the body, the nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, does continue to play a role, interestingly enough, by causing vasoconstriction in those areas that really should not be requiring all that much oxygen and nutrients at this time, such as your digestive viscera, to some extent the skin, although as we ex exercise, we are, we are going to see some thermoregulation needing to occur by means of vasodilation, so that's a little bit contradictory here, um, and also the kidneys, for instance. So the, the, all these me mechanisms that control blood flow can really redirect the blood to areas where it is desperately needed. So that brings us to the lungs. And as I said, in the lungs, the autoregulatory mechanisms are going to work opposite than what we've seen so far in the other organs. And this will make complete sense. Once you remember that gas exchange in the lungs occurs in the opposite direction, then gas exchange occurs in the other tissues of the body. So let's take a quick look at this sketch I just drew. In the lungs, we have these little air sacs we call alveoli. Singular, we would write alveolus. 
they have just some simple squamous epithelium that makes up their wall so that it's very easy for, for gases to diffuse through their wall. And of course, our capillaries themselves are also only made up of simple squamous epithelial tissue. So in which direction does oxygen travel in the lungs? Well, in the lungs, it moves from the tissue cells, that is our alveolar um, or alveoli, into the capillaries. We're now loading the blood with oxygen. On the other hand, the carbon dioxide that has accumulated in our tissues because our blood has visited the tissues and picked up that carbon dioxide, we want to exhale that carbon dioxide and so we're going to allow to diffuse it into the alveoli of the lungs so that it indeed can leave the lungs via the trachea be exhaled through our mouth or through our nose. So the gas exchange is in the opposite direction in the lungs than what happens in all of the other tissues. In all of the other tissues, we see that oxygen leaves the capillaries and carbon dioxide enters the capillaries. I'm hoping that you see that the direction of the gases in the lungs is completely opposite. So therefore, we're going to see that the autoregulatory mechanism, the metabolic autoregulatory mechanism in particular, is going to be op working opposite as well. So for instance, if we find that there are low levels of oxygen in the alveoli, so let's say that there are only low levels of oxygen in the alveoli, we're not wanting to send the blood in this capillary now. What's the point? There is no oxygen to pick up, right? On the other hand, if oxygen levels are high in the alveolus, let's send the blood there so that it can pick up that oxygen. Finally, we get to the skin and blood flow in the skin is necessary, of course, to provide nutrients, but also to allow us to thermoregulate. As you know very well, when you are exercising, for instance, you get rather flushed looking and a lot of that has to do with the fact that blood vessels near your skin or in your skin or and nearby your skin are vasodilating uh, which allows us to um, allows us to let go with the heat that is accumulated uh, in our blood from our very active skeletal muscles for instance at rest our skin also functions as a good bl blood reservoir, so quite a, blood, quite a bit of blood is actually stored in our skin. Flow in our blood in our skin is primarily regulated by means of sympathetic nervous system reflexes, and they begin with the detection of stimuli by our thermoreceptors, which are our temperature sensing receptors, and it also involves the central nervous system. More specifically, the hypothalamus. So for instance, as the temperature around us begins to increase, causing our body temperature to increase, or we might just be exercising vigorously, or we have a fever, regardless of what causes the, the rise in temperature, this rise in temperature is going to be conveyed by means of the thermoreceptors to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus will respond by making sure that the blood vessels in the skin are not going to express as much vasomotor tone anymore. Remember that at rest, our blood vessels are primarily um, in a slightly constricted um, um, format. The smooth muscles are slightly constricted, called vasomotor tone, and we can reduce that vasomotor tone if we reduce um, the release of neurotransmitters onto those blood vessel skin uh, vessels, and when they vasodilate, the heat can radiate from the skin. We can, of course, also sweat when we're hot, and sweat actually can cause vasodilation by stimulating the release of chemicals that um, trigger this vasodilation and they're called bradykinins. The bradykinins are also going to help with 
the secretion of nitric oxide, and we all know by now that that is a potent vasodilator. If, on the other hand, our body temperature drops, we need to, and, and drops significantly, we need to make sure that we take care of our more vital organs. We, we want to protect them, and therefore we're not going to keep that blood in the skin, and instead we're going to divert the blood more to the digestive structures, reproductive structures, even the heart, uh, even the brain. This then finally wraps up our chapter on the blood vessels.